Today I'm at Capital Economics talking to Roger Bootle, who's the head of the winning team in the Wolfson Prize, which is a competition to find the least disruptive way for a country to exit the Euro. Roger Bootle, thanks very much for talking to us. Now this Wolfson Prize, the competition, why was it important to you to put together such a strong entry? I was fascinated by the question that Lord Wolfson posed. And as I thought about it, I quickly became aware that no one had really satisfactorily even, I think, attempted to answer it. And I thought we could learn a lot as well as contributing quite a lot in trying to answer it. And that's what we did. And talk me through your winning entry. Very briefly, a country wanting to leave the euro must prepare a plan in secret among a very small group of senior ministers and officials. Pretty much as soon as the plan is agreed, it must be enacted in order to prevent news leaking out. Uh, the banks will have to be closed over a relevant period, which is probably a weekend, and during that period capital controls will be in place. On, let's say, the Friday night, it will be announced to the people of the departing country, let's call it Greece, that from then on, all amounts that were in their bank accounts, their pensions or whatever, their wages, prices, which were formerly expressed in euros, were now to be expressed in drachmas. And we suggest that the conversion rate between euros and drachmas be one for one. Now, a lot of people get this mixed up. They think, well, in that case, what about the exchange rate? On the exchanges, there's no connection between the official conversion rate and what the drachma trades at. And we're pretty sure it would trade at a much lower rate, probably around one and a half or perhaps even two to one against the euro. Then the banks open again on the Monday or Tuesday. People put in their cards into their ATMs. Uh, they can get euros out of their bank accounts, which are now expressed in drachma, but they only get those out at the exchange rate that rules now between euros and drachma, because now the euro is, is treated as a foreign currency. Now initially, they're not going to have drachma notes and coins available. I think a lot of people have got fixated on that. We argue it doesn't really matter. For the overwhelming majority of transactions, particularly business transactions, they're done electronically anyway, and people use cards, debit cards and credit cards. They continue to do all that, only when they use them, it's drachma that they're actually transacting. For small transactions that require cash, then our suggestion is Greece carries on using euros until new drachma notes are available. But euros at the exchange rate or euros at the new one-on-one -on -one parity with the, with the drachma? Well, what will tend to happen is that a dual price system will develop because people will know that uh, drachma aren't the same as euros, although they've been converted at the one-for-one -one rate. They'll tend to be a different price for euro cash as compared to drachma credit or drachma debit cards. Uh, and that will be, to some extent, messy, uh, but it will be perfectly practical. There are a lot of countries in the world that operate a dual currency and dual pricing system. This all sounds very simple um, in, terms of, in terms of real people using real money. Are there other complications uh, at the kind of macroeconomic level? Well, there are huge complications and problems, and one of the biggest is going to concern the legal position. Because what would happen at the point uh, that Greece leaves the euro is it would re-denominate its debt, its national debt, into drachma. Uh, now, as far as domestic Greek residents are concerned, they're not going to have any comeback on that. That's, that uh, change is going to stand in, under Greek law in Greek courts. But there are going to be all sorts of contracts involving non-Greek citizens where there's going to be a lot of legal argy-bargy because, uh, let's say, a German creditor, for the sake of argument, is not going to want his asset converted into drachma. And he's going to argue that this contract was framed in euros and it should still be in euros. And in Greece, they're going to say, oh, no, 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 it's now in drachma. And so there are going to be arguments. The courts could be heavily involved. But the scope for that can also be reduced if Eurozone governments reach an agreement on all this, which I think they probably would, they then have to lay down guidelines uh, under which terms uh, a contract would be interpreted in drachma and on which occasions it would be uh, in euros, and that would minimise the scope for legal argument. The other major issue, it's not a complication, it's a reality, is that Initially, this is going to be very far from a magic wand. When the drachma falls on the exchanges, the price of 
goods and services in Greece is going to go up, possibly by quite a lot. So initially, living standards are going to be squeezed. Far from bringing relief to the ordinary Greek person, it's actually going to make matters worse, initially. However, going forward, things are then completely transformed because in a flash, Greece is more competitive. Not the grinding deflation over 10 or 15 years, but instantaneously, Greece is 40 or 50 or 60 percent more competitive, and the demand for Greek output is going to take off. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, but in a matter of months, that will happen. Greek exports will start to rise, Greek imports will fall, and that will generate employment and more income in Greece. So there's a trade-off, a difficult period to go through, first of all, in order to secure later greater prosperity. So if you compare that situation to the austerity that the Greeks are now facing, which would you say is a better plan? I think there's no doubt that Greece, in my view, needs to get out of the euro. I cannot see any way in which this current policy of austerity is going to bring any relief. For a start, this grinding process of trying to bring prices and wages down takes not years but decades to correct the sort of uncompetitiveness that Greece is going through. And what's more, it raises the real value of debt. So Greece and the other weaker members of the euro face not one key problem but two. They're uncompetitive, that's to say their costs and prices are out of line with other countries in the euro, and they're also saddled with very high levels of debt. The problem with domestic deflation is in principle, admittedly very badly, but in principle it deals with one of these problems, namely the lack of competitiveness, but at the cost of making the other problem, debt, even worse. And what we're talking about is, is countries, not only Greece, but possibly other countries then leaving the euro after that. Europhiles seem to fear uh, the breakup of the eurozone like some kind of Armageddon. Do you think that's a realistic fear? Well, I think they're right to fear the breakup of the eurozone um, because uh, if Greece, for instance, were to leave, obviously we don't know how it would all work out. And I suppose it's possible that the rest of the eurozone would then uh, hang together, but I doubt it. I think if Greece leaves before very long, other countries, countries will leave as well, and we'll end up probably with the peripheral countries, possibly all five of them, that's to say Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece and Spain, all outside the Euro, possibly even joined by France, with some northern core remaining. So in terms of thinking what might happen, I think these people are absolutely right. With regard to the consequences though, I think they're uh, completely wrong in the sense that uh, you have to ask yourself, and the leaders of Europe have to ask themselves, how can you imagine prosperity and stability for Europe under the current setup? What is the mechanism through which countries that are at the moment mired in not just a recession, but frankly a depression, through which those countries can regain prosperity, economic growth and stability. I wish they could uh, tell us something along that because all I hear whenever they have a summit is they keep banging on about various forms of debt support and never about economic growth. Now, I say I don't think it's possible to imagine a return to economic growth in the current setup. By contrast, if the euro breaks, I can imagine economic growth. So far from being a disaster, I think it could be the major step that leads to the restoration of growth in Europe. And what about these uh, attempts to shore up the Eurozone that we've seen recently? Another bailout for Greece, cheap money flooding into national banks from the ECB. Are they going to have any effect? Well, I suppose it's possible to keep the whole show on the road that way if the northern countries are prepared to carry on shoveling this money into the southern countries. Although, I, frankly, I think that there will come a limit because eventually the sums involved are going to be absolutely enormous and voters in the northern countries will say we don't want all this. But even if the continued shoveling of money does take place, which keeps the show on the road, Again, that doesn't actually bring economic growth in the South. All it's doing is preventing a financial collapse, whereas these are countries that have undergone a very big drop in output and have got huge levels of unemployment. And is what we're seeing just purely a kind of fight between politics and economics? Is the reason that Angela Merkel, for example, is so desperate to keep the Eurozone together because it's the major political project that Germany has implemented over the last 30 years or so? I think the politics and the economics are really very closely intertwined and it's often difficult to work out where one stops and the other begins. Uh, I think you have to appreciate that the European elites didn't have a pretty firm grasp of the economics from the start. 
Now I think they're getting the economics completely wrong. That's to say their opposition to the idea, their fear of the idea of Euro breakup isn't just about the politics. They think that the economics point very strongly that way as well because they fear the financial chaos that would stem from a, a Euro breakup and they don't see the benefits to economic growth. So I think they are opposed on both economic and political grounds. And we talk a lot about uh, about the, the collapse of the euro, essentially. But all through this, the currency has been oddly resilient, hasn't it? Only really winding down now from quite a decent rate against the dollar. What do you put that down to? I think this is a really big puzzle, quite why the euro has been so strong. There are reasons that one can put forward. I'm not myself completely convinced by any of them. But one thing I think to bear in mind is foreign exchange markets are notoriously short-sighted. And the argument against the euro has always been that essentially it will collapse through the weight of its own contradictions as to when people have been unable to say, well, exchange markets tend not to like to bet on things like that. You know, something may happen next year, maybe next month, maybe in five years' time. It's not a really very solid thing to go on. Then there's also the question of what form the euro might take if it survives, because if the weaker countries leave the eurozone, arguably the euro is going to be a strong currency. So very far from selling it, if you thought that sort of breakup that was going to happen, you ought to be buying it. If the euro does become a currency that applies to many fewer countries, will it still retain its attractiveness for investors or are we looking at a return to dollar denomination, for example? Oh, I think that the euro could continue to be a very attractive currency. Indeed, for many people, it might be even more attractive. Uh, if you could imagine that what's going to happen is the departure of the weaker peripheral countries, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece and Spain, and perhaps even France, then the euro is, as it were, a greater Deutschmark. It's Germany and its close satellites and it's going to be run, that, cur that currency area, very much presumably the way that the, uh, the Germany used to be run under the Deutschmark. And accordingly, I think investors will like that, that currency really very much. Roger Bootle, thank you very much.